Hi everyone, this is Connor with The Way Within and in this video I'd like to talk about the archetype of the king which is one of the four main archetypes that were put forth by Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette in their book King, Warrior, Magician, Lover Rediscovering the Archetypes of the Mature Masculine Psyche and in this video I'd like to focus on the king archetype which is the central archetype it's the main archetype of the four so the king archetype as we know is most commonly embodied or was most commonly embodied by men and specifically men as kings you know rulers of kingdoms in human society throughout history and you know still to this day although I suppose the potency the power of that that role has waned and diminished as society has modernized to some extent and the thing about real kings like kings that have existed or still exist today they're channeling that archetype they we're not just talking about physical kings we're talking about the archetype that they're channeling from the metaphysical world it channels through them and they give it out to the people you know because these archetypes they're present in every single one of us we all have the king within us and when we see that materialize as a, as a living person as a virtuous king it lights that up within us it gives us a template to modern to model our own king, kinship upon so that's why it can be incredibly beneficial for men but also for women and for boys and girls to have role models to have kings in the world that they can look up to and you know women can embody can embody it too they have their own version of the king archetype um i suppose you could call it the queen uh carol s pearson she talks more about the female archetypes now in, in these videos i'm going to focus on the male archetypes so the king the king has two primary functions the first is providing order and the second is providing a mixture of fertility and blessing so starting with the first one ordering the king as I said the physical king he channels the king archetype from the, the metaphysical world the unseen world the unmanifest world and in this he also channels right order or you could say natural order or divine order the unmanifest god if you will has a divine order you know everything that god creates it is divinely ordered and beautiful and there are you know mathematical principles that work in the universe everything is just beautifully orchestrated you know but when it comes to the material world there can be chaos you know and there can be chaos especially in human societies you know because man has free will and you know man can veer towards virtuosity or man can veer towards chaos and so the, the function of kings in days of old but also today even and the function of the king within us is to channel that divine order from the creator from god into the physical and to make it manifest so that is what the function of the king was and still is to this day is to channel right order into the kingdom so that the kingdom flourishes so that the kingdom has order and it and it thrives as a result and the way that the king did this was by encoding rules and regulations that gave structures and boundaries to the kingdom so the people knew what they could and could not do and it was in their best interest when the king was virtuous and he would encode um, as few laws as possible but as many as necessary for the people to flourish 
and you know that's that right order then it stands in contrast to what's outside the kingdom or the boundaries that the king sets and outside the kingdom you often see this depicted in film outside the kingdom is where chaos reigns you know where the where evil dwells you know where the where the demonic holds sway and you see that you know in the lion king where um simba's father you know he he says that the, that their kingdom this is is what the sun sets on and beyond that you know that's that's where they don't go that's where chaos and evil dwell you know and you have it in the lord of the rings for example with the kingdom of gondor and rohan and beyond that they're just wild lands and chaos and beyond gondor you have mordor you know where pure evil reigns and all of that and orcs and all of these things so the king provides rules and regulations he, he channels divine order down into his kingdom through rules and regulations and providing uh, just structure for his society and outside of that then is chaos. Now the second function of the king is twofold it's about providing fertility on the one hand and it's about providing blessing as well. So with regards to fertility um, you could say in more ancient societies that uh, there was a focus on on the mother. You know, there was a focus on Mother Earth. And there are some examples of matriarchal societies that are contradictory to this. Like, you know, for example, the Iroquois Confederacy, which was a confederacy of Native American tribes near the Great Lakes in the United States around the time of, of colonization. And, you know, they had a matriarchal society. There are other matriarchal societies around the world that emphasize the feminine and stuff, stuff like that. But, and, you know, you had the, um, you had certain pre-Christian European societies as well and cultures that would have emphasized or played, placed great emphasis on the feminine and um, more so than in, let's say, the medieval periods. But, you know, as patriarchal societies arose whereby you know men took charge um the emphasis shifted from the feminine to the masculine and and i suppose the emphasis shifted from the the mother and, and the feminine as the giver of life to the king and the masculine providing fertility through his order and the structures that he created through that kingdoms flourished societies flourished and people saw that you know so they came to associate the king with fertility so the second aspect then of this um i suppose twofold function is is blessing and you'll see this with kings depicted in film and also in real life it will be true as well you know leading masculine figures who are very virtuous um you know kings um leaders of any kind that are in their virtuosity they provide blessing to their people they provide blessing to the downtrodden they lift up the downtrodden they lift up and protect and bless the innocent they see the goodness in others they see the best in others and they bring that out and they encourage it in others through praise and recognition and this is what the best kings do they they praise their subjects they they hold um celebrations where they recognize members of the community and they shower them with praise and awards and they they make them feel honored you know that's that's the king in his fullness that's the king in his most virtuous you know and it's beautiful and um i suppose the the blessing that the king gives is like a, it's a spiritual blessing you know when somebody when in an individual or a group of people is seen in the light of the king energy the king ar archetype channeled from on high through the king individual that's an incredible um incredibly healing nourishing event you know and 
I think, you know, just speaking about today, that's, um, that's one of the issues I see with the lack of strong masculine role models for men is that a lot of men out there, they're suffering from a lack of the king energy in their life, you know, and a lack of kings in their lives, um, strong men who recognize their greatness and who nurture their greatness within them as they're growing, you know. And, um, you know, don't get me wrong, like anything can be overcome, like just because one didn't have a, you know, strong male role models in life doesn't mean they can't overcome that, you know, they can recover and become a strong male role model themselves, you know. Um, but yeah, that's what the king does and not necessarily just kings, but, you know, strong masculine role models in their in their true virtuosity they they uplift others and they praise others they see the goodness in others uh, they strengthen the goodness in others by seeing it recognizing it honoring it um and yeah so that's blessing and that's the second function of the king the king also sets out principles, I suppose this is part of the natural order, or the right order or the divine order. The king sets out principles that uphold the natural order as well. So it's not just about rules and regulations, but also he he emphasizes, and this isn't just kings again, but you know, those in a virtuous state, men and women, they emphasize those qualities and principles that support life that support society that make society flourish like things like family you know a focus on the future an optimistic future you know setting a vision for your people giving your people ideals to to live up to giving your people's ideals to strive for for a better future you know focusing on family on having faith you know faith whether it be uh, a traditional religion like christianity or just a spirituality you know emphasizing a connection with the unseen you know with the metaphysical with the creator with the unmanifest family faith tradition a future to look forward to you know these are things that the king archetype true people um enshrines and gives others hope and life true so that's something else that the king archetype does true kings and true other uh, role models and the king again i'll remind you is within all of us you know this energy is within every single one of us and we can channel this when we're in our virtue and when we're living life um in alignment you know we can we can access this energy and share it with others you know and if you ever lift somebody up and you know, everybody is capable of this, lifting others up, praising others, any of that. That's the king energy in you, you know. That's the king energy shining true. And, you know, the king energy, obviously, like the... We've seen, we've seen bad kings too, you know. We've seen kings and, and and male role models and leaders who have gone astray as it were and who've created more havoc and destruction than they have order and blessing you know and when we get into this realm we're talking about the shadow aspect of the king archetype the four archetypes that i mentioned in the beginning of the video and by the way i'm going to make a video on each of these archetypes um so the king, the warrior, the magician, the lover. Each of these archetypes has a shadow side. So there's a side of it that's, that when it's in its fullness, it's positive, it's virtuous, it's in service to others. But then there's the opposite, there's the shadow side. And this is when the archetype hasn't been fully integrated, when there's, there's some kind of weakness there or ego involved i suppose and the thing about the shadow of each archetype is that it's bipolar there's always two sides uh, an active principle and a passive principle so the active principle of the king shadow 
is or the king arch archetype shadow is the tyrant and the tyrant as you probably you, you probably recognize or intuit what what it's about just from the word and your associations with it but the tyrant is very um aggressive um tyrannical the tyrant seeks to control others the tyrant seeks to hold an iron fist over his kingdom you know to have a tight grasp on his on his subjects and the tyrant you know sets draconian laws and regulations he t he takes the order which is supposed to provide fertility blessing order righteousness and he he takes it to the extreme so that the order becomes authoritarian so the tyrant oppresses his subjects he doesn't lift them up he oppresses them and you know this can show up for anyone it can show up again the shadow just like the king and all the other positive archetypes are present in every single one of us the shadows of those archetypes is present in every single one of us as well and you could say in a way the shadow of each of those four archetypes plus maybe some other minor archetypes that could be discussed all of those shadows together they make up our collective shadow you know the the ego within us or at least the dark side of the ego and all of that so we have it in us you know and it can come out in us you know in our lower moments that we we have this tyrant show up or any of the other shadows you know and again the tyrant is about controlling others you know it's about um wanting absolute control and it has a kind of uh an envy to it you know it's kind of got this paranoid envy um and the reason for that is because behind the active front or veneer of the tyrant is the passive principle, which is the uh, the weakling. So behind every tyrant is actually a weakling in disguise, you know. And um, uh, I just thought actually there's a beautiful representation of this in... Um, it's a very subtle one, but it's a beautiful rep representation that caught my eye in um, one of my favorite animations. It's called, funnily enough, it's called In Shadow. Definitely check that out. I'm just realizing now how, how connected this all is, you know. But In Shadow, you can get it on YouTube. It's an amazing animation that shows it's all about the shadow of humanity, humanity's collective shadow. And how all basically these archetypes that we're talking about, the shadow of those, it's present in humanity and the society we've been living in, it's been run by the shadow, you know, and it's been a, quite a dark society and we're emerging out of that now. But um, this animation, it just takes a journey through all of that in a very beautiful way. And then it shows at the end, basically the liberation of humanity and the spiritual awakening of humanity. And it's a very beautiful video. But there's one... Um, there's one symbol symbol in that whole animation that that connects with this, and it's um. It just shows a kind of a a character. He's like a a fat banker or something, and um. He uh, it shows it symbolizes first. There's a scene where it shows humanity like breaking out of their chains, um, and. There's like a box around the head. It smashes open, and humanity is being freed for the first time. And then you get this this symbol of of this banker, and initially he's laughing. It shows his face in like four sequences, and his first the first way it shows his face is he's laughing, and then the next, you know, the arrogance, and then the next face is like anger, um, like that's the tyrant. Then you see anger. He's enraged. There's this seething, paranoid envy or, or rage that that others could have freedom and joy. But then when that disappears, there's there's a sadness, you know. It shows him crying, which is really the pain behind the shadow. And it ties in with this, this weakling uh, shadow perfectly, the passive principle, the weakling. So it's that, you know, it's... There's the veneer of the active principle of the tyrant, but behind every tyrant there's a weakling who's very afraid. He's like, the weakling is basically just this like fearful, um, uh, 
child you know this fearful child that just wants to be loved and uh, has has had its love very twisted and another great example of this is if you look at Voldemort in Harry Potter you know how he's this very tyrannical uh, vindictive shadow king but then there's that scene when he's defeated and Harry and Dumbledore are in like a train station in some heavenly realm and you see the the curled up like wretched fetus of Voldemort under the bench and he's just like this this disgusting curled up little baby and that's the weakling side again of behind the tyrant the tyrannical front you know so you get that polarity but the weakling anyway it's basically uh, as it shows up in traditional kings it would be like somebody who's cowardly or who's unwilling to take the necessary actions to to protect his kingdom or to allow it to flourish you know and who's unable to see the goodness in others you know and, and to lift them up and praise them as the virtuous king does and so that's the the two polarities of the shadow of the king so you've got the positive virtuous king it's like a triangle you know it's like a triangle with three points up the top you've got the virtuous king in his fullness he provides order fertility and blessing he he lifts up his subjects he ensures that life flourishes in his kingdom and that chaos is kept out you know so that his people can thrive and he channels that archetype in through himself from the divine into the physical world so that others can feel their own king in themselves and so they can they can come into their power and fullness as a result of seeing their greatness reflected in their physical king and that again i will say is why especially you know we're talking about men in this case it's true for women also but i'm just covering men for this video so i want to say that that's why uh, strong masculine figures in society are so powerful and so uplifting for men and why it's so key that we have our kings in society i'm not talking necessarily about literal kings but when i say kings i mean strong male role models that's why men need their kings and women too because women of course benefit by having virtuous strong men in society so everybody wins by having strong male strong men in society and there's a quote there it's um toxic masculinity is not the presence of manhood it's the absence of it and so that's the the king in his fullness at the peak of the pyramid or the triangle and then you've got the polarity of the 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 two um principles of the shadow you've got the active principle of the tyrant and you've got the passive principle of the weakling and i suppose just as a final area to explore um on this topic is that there's actually uh i suppose this this whole this trifecta is present for every archetype in childhood as well in a lesser form and robert moore and douglas gillette actually um explored this and gave terms to the different archetypes there as well so in childhood the equivalent of the king in his fullness is called the divine child and um i suppose there's not much there's not too much here that i want to add other than illustrate that these archetypes are present for children as well the divine child it's the same you know obviously the, the child isn't going to have as much power to provide order and fertility and blessing it's still a child you know but it is channeling its own greatness and i suppose what it's about as well with the king is the king comes online in men and children when all the other archetypes are in balance and when they're channeled you know so, so the the warrior the magician and the lover and so a child that has those archetypes in balance will channel its own version of the king energy the divine child so it's basically like a very loving child um a very virtuous child um who is good to others you know and who sees the goodness in other children and, and lifts children up you know and um speaks well of other children you know uh i suppose adheres to to rules and regulations themselves you know um follows a virtuous life in as much as a child can and then you have the the shadow of the divine child so children have their shadows too of course you know 
and for the child the shadow of the divine child archetype or the, the child's version of the king arch archetype is the the active principle is called the the high chair tyrant which is kind of funny it, it just i think it just sums it up perfectly you know that image of the child in the you know the high chair where children you know children have these high chairs that they put into where they they have their food on the little table and you have that image of the child that acts um, precocious and he starts slamming the plate off the table or throwing his food off the table you know that's the high chair tyrant you know screaming and wailing and demanding you know that's that shadow that active shadow principle showing up for some of the first times in that person's life you know demanding tyrannizing the household with its wails and its screams and all of that so that's that side and then the the passive side um is just called the weakling prince so you know the the little you know when a child acts and I I remember her doing both of these as a child so I remember channeling both these shadows and I remember channeling the the divine child too you know I remember times when I was in my fullness and I was lifting other children up but I remember two times when I was demanding or times when I acted weakling to curry favor or to curry sympathy and that's what that passive principle is about the weakling prince so in that case the child is acting uh, intentionally weak you know the child might be sickly that's might ha that might be how it shows up the child is sickly and it needs um continuous affection and nourishment and all of that and it might show up that ch the child is acting like a victim you know to curry favor and to curry sympathy um basically acting like it has no power acting like it's at the mercy of others and relishing that that role in a kind of uh, masochistic manner and that shows up for all children at some point or another and uh, like i said both the the high chair tyrant and the the weakling prince and the divine child the child in his fullness or her fullness uh, so we have all of it in us you know all of these archetypes they spring from what's called the unmanifest the metaphysical world so what it's key to understand here is we don't just have this physical world around us. This isn't the be-all and end-all of reality. There is a world beyond and behind and beneath this one that is more fundamental. It's the spiritual world. It's the world of archetypes and metaphysics. It's the world beyond the physical from which the physical springs. And in that world, you also, connected with that, you have what Jung, Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, called the collective unconscious. So the collective unconscious of all of humanity is connected intimately with the metaphysical world. It's an aspect of it. And in that collective unconscious, we have all of these archetypes that are present. And how they develop, basically, was just over tens and thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years of humanity living in different societies and seeing natural order and how it arises and these archetypes arose and they got embedded in our collective unconscious throughout humanity's evolution and now they're there forever forever more for us to tap into to access the channel and we can choose to channel the archetypes in their fullness or we can channel their shadow aspects when we're in our lower states when we're in our weaker points when when the ego has greater hold over us and so it's good to be aware of these archetypes, you know, because they they provide a framework for our behavior. They provide a framework for how we see the world, how we see each other, how we see society. And they give us ideals to live up to, to categorize idealistic behaviors that we can that we can keep in mind and that we can move towards embodying more and more as we move along our journey of personal growth and evolution. So a really handy framework, a really handy tool set to work with in that regard. And so that's the king archetype in, in its fullness as much as I can describe it. Um, I'm going to create videos on the other three main archetypes for the masculine psyche as well. So the warrior, the magician and the lover. I suppose one other caveat to mention is that the king as well as the, uh, the warrior archetypes they're more left brain oriented whereas the magician and the lover are right brain oriented 
So the left brain is more about logic, you know, coherence, uh, structure, order, mathematics, these kind of things. So the king and the warrior are more on that side. Whereas the magician and the lover are more on the right side of the brain. They're associated with the right hemisphere. So the right hemisphere is to do with creativity. It's about passion. It's about intimacy. It's about intuition. It's about interconnectivity. It's about nature, art, beauty, all of this kind of thing. So it's amazing how everything just connects together beautifully. You know, everything is connected. And there's two archetypes either side, you know. Um, yeah. And... Uh, Yeah, I suppose that's it for this video. So I hope that was helpful for you. I hope it was insightful. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for the other archetypes. If you enjoyed this video, I'll, I'll create those as well. So if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. And I also have a free 10-page e-booklet that you can check out. The link is in the description below. So have a look at that. It's The Alkalizing Morning Ritual. A morning ritual to kickstart your day, to alkalize the body, to get grounded. Um, some really helpful practices in there that will uh, aid your personal growth and your journey. So really cool stuff. Check that out. And other than that, I yeah, thanks again for watching. Um, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.